Well, good morning and welcome to Amford Evangelical Church's online or on the phone service. Let me, Sammy Davis, one of the leaders here in the church, wish you a very happy Easter because today, if you didn't know, is the beginning of Easter proper. Today is Palm Sunday and almost every single day this week has value, has weight, has importance to us as Christians as we remember and reflect on and learn from the various things that happened to Jesus in that famous final week. From Palm Sunday, today, celebrating, remembering Jesus, entering Jerusalem as King, right the way through to Easter Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection. In fact, there's going to be a lot going on in the life of the church, a lot of things that you can get involved with from this evening where we meet together in Llysern, that's our church building in Amford, um, for a time of praise, for a time of worship this Palm Sunday, because on that first Palm Sunday, when Jesus rode towards Jerusalem, the people saw him, the people recognised him, they responded with worship and praise and song. That's what we're going to be doing this evening. You're more than welcome to join us. And then right throughout the week, we're going to be marking some of these special occasions with special events in the life of the church. You'll have seen the times and dates already. They'll pop up again towards the end. Folks in physical services will be getting these uh, this morning. But let me just draw your attention to the, to the business end of the week, to Good Friday, um, Easter Saturday and Easter Sunday, and fill you in on what we think is a pretty special suite of gatherings to help us savour and make the most of Easter. The first one is this, on Good Friday, as we're um, inclined to do, we're meeting together at 10.30 in the morning, meeting over in Llandebia Memorial Hall for a special communion service. As we stop, as we look to the cross, as we remember in a special way the sacrifice that Christ made, we're going to be having a service together, and that is open and uh, available to anyone who wants to come and take communion together and to worship. Then on Easter Saturday, we're having uh, something a little bit special. We're having an Easter egg hunt around town. It's going to be uh, an Easter egg hunt with a difference as people need to solve clues and make their way around the town before finishing up in our church building, at least uh, where chocolate eggs and crafts and goodness knows what will be available for grown-ups and for kids. Um, and then Easter Sunday is a pretty jam-packed day if you want it to be. We're going to be beginning with prayer up Betos Mountain. Um, we drive up Betos Mountain patch past Scotch Pines, not quite as far as the wind turbines. There's a little lookout point and it's a wonderful opportunity. We do it every year to look out over and to pray over the Ammon Valley, that place where God has called us to go and share the good news, the hope that we have in the resurrected Jesus. For any and all who have made the trip at the mountain, you're then invited back to Llandebia for a bit of breakfast, for some tea and toast before our 10.30 service. And all together, everyone who can make it, celebration of the fact that Jesus died, defeated death, beat Satan, did away with sin and his power and his claims over us, and has risen to new and glorious eternal life. That's going to happen at 10.30, so recognise the Good Friday, the Easter Sunday, the services are at 10.30 together. And then probably the cherry on the cake is at 3pm on Easter Sunday, we're going to be celebrating that new birth come reality in the life of someone in our church. We're going to be having a baptism together. And rather excitingly, we're going to be taking that baptism on the road and we're going to be making our way down to Caswell Bay, um, down the Gower, to baptise in those open waters, in that public space forum, uh, little Annie Williams. Annie shared her testimony with the church at the beginning of the year, and she'll be sharing it again on Easter Sunday. But what a joy it's going to be to gather together as God's people, welcoming her into our family of faith. Now that's uh, a pretty long way to go for some folks, um, maybe like me, you don't really know where Caswell Bay is. Well, one of the good things that we think we're doing is laying on a coach so that anybody who wants to be a part of that can come and be a part of that. You're going to need to book 
a space on the course, so head over to the website amfordchurch.com and you'll be able to find a button there, uh, book a bus, um, to join with us. It's going to be, I think, a wonderful opportunity to enjoy Easter, to celebrate baptism and be together as a church. We recognise that so many people still are uncertain about coming and gathering in the confines of a building. Well, we're out there in the open. The fresh sea air will be blowing over us and so it would be wonderful if many of those um, who are used to come in and meeting together physically and those perhaps who haven't returned to services yet we're able to come together as one, brought together in Christ to celebrate that too. Now, that's a lot of dates and times and info. As I said, that was at the start of the service. You can go back and watch it again. I'm sure that through the wizardry of technology, I'll be able to get those times and dates up on the screen towards the end of the service as well. But just to kick off what we're actually doing this morning, it's Palm Sunday, as I said, but we're gonna be looking at a different period of that Easter week. We're going to be looking at the story together this morning of the Last Supper, when Jesus institutes, we say, the communion, gives the, the words and the pattern and the habit to the disciples, to the church, of how we should gather together often to eat and to drink in remembrance of what he has done. And that Last Supper is actually uh, an evolution of another meal that is celebrated in the scriptures. And that meal is the Passover, the remembering of what God has done in the history of Israel, of his intervention to, to create a people for himself. And so I've been led to believe that Psalm 118 was the sort of hymn that they would sing um, at the Last Supper, at a Passover meal. And I wanted to read a couple of these words to us this morning before we go any further. Psalm 118, having started, continues like this. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things, they cry. The Lord's right hand is lifted up. The Lord's right hand has done many things. This is a celebration of what God has done. I will not die, but live, and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you have answered me and you have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God. He has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good and his love endures forever. It's a song actually, if you notice, that looks back at what God has done in rescuing. That kind of looks around and sees what God is doing to rescue here and now. And is a song which calls for God to continue to rescue and rescue in new and special ways in the future. I think that's a wonderful psalm, a wonderful song for us to begin our service with this morning as we contemplate what God has done to rescue us, how he is rescuing us now, and how fully that rescue will be revealed in the future. Let's pray and then we'll sing together. Lord God, we thank you for everything involved in Easter week. We thank you that in different interactions, in different stories, our eyes are turned, our gaze is lifted up to Jesus, that we would see the fullness and the breadth of who he is and what he has done. Lord, even this morning, even through these digital means, I pray that you would help us to see Jesus, to be drawn closer in, to recognise for the first time or for the thousandth time something special and something wonderful about him and to be changed by Lord because Jesus changes those who encounter him. So be with us, and the Holy Spirit be at work amongst us, that we would be encountering and being transformed this morning through everything we do. In Jesus' precious name, 
Amen. sitting now. If you have anything nearby that's kind of normal, nobody would really notice it if they walked into the room, but, but really is something special to you. I found a few things digging around the office and in my work bag earlier on. This is just a bit of, pe- bit of paper torn out of a notebook with some questionable handwriting on it. This is, this is a letter from my son. It looks fairly normal, isn't it? It's kind of just a random bit of paper, but it's a letter from Johan, my eldest. And it reminds me of the day that we walked up a hill outside Edinburgh on a family holiday up for a family wedding. Just him and I, early in the morning, walked up Arthur's seat and we looked over the city and he wrote a little note to the rest of the family to tell them what we were up to. And I showed it to them later and then I put it in my wallet just to remember. A really happy memory. Or how about this? Can you see that? This is a hair elastic, a little bobble, which is obviously not for me. My hair isn't quite long enough to need things like this, but, um, but this is Miriam's, my daughter's. Reminds me of her whenever I open my wallet. I stuck that in there. Uh, It's just a little keepsake. How about this? This is a a tiny little piece of torn tissue paper, Um, but it's important to me. This is from a concert I went to with Bethan, my wife, and Rodri and Kerry Darcy. We went to watch John Mayer, American singer-songwriter, a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic, uh, at the O2 Live in London. 
And at the end of the concert, they dropped all the ticker tape. Uh, it was just a brilliant night, really good memories. And I took one of those little pieces of ticker tape home in my wallet to remind me. I wonder if you've got anything like that. Average run of the, run of the mill, everyday things, but that mean a lot to you. Well, that's what the story is is all about that we're going to read today. Luke chapter 22, if you want to follow along as I read it now, it's the story of Jesus taking everyday bread and everyday wine in the context of a special meal, but everyday things, bread and wine, and pouring into them really special meaning. He says, this is my body. This is my blood. These are two normal everyday things that are supposed to remind you of me giving myself to die for you so that you could be clean, so that you could be knew where I would die so that you could live and know God forever. I, do you see that? They're really normal things, bread and wine, but really special meaning. So let me read you the story of the Last Supper from Luke 22. Now the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas called Iscariot one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a water, a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Do you see it in that story? Jesus taking really simple things, but telling us the most important of things through them. He is going to die for us. Three things I want us to learn about his death today from that passage. First is his death is planned. It's prepared. He knows it's coming. It's, it's not an accident. It's planned. Second thing, it's a royal death. And third, it's a death for you. Okay, see if you can remember those things and spot them as we go through. Jesus' death is planned. Um, you'll know that if you've been reading through Luke, if you know the story. Jesus sees it coming. It's not an accident. It's not some kind of tragic thing that creeps up on him. No, Jesus' death is deliberate. He knows that it's coming. You can see that in this story here, don't you? Um, he knows that he has to suffer. That's, in, um, uh, that's up in verse 14, 15. He knows that he's going to die. He knows who's going to betray him. He knows this guy is going to walk out of the, of the town with water or a water jar on his head. He knows everything. All the way through Luke's gospel, he's been saying, the son of man, talking about himself, must suffer. He's been predicting it. He knows it's going to happen and he embraces it. Jesus' death is deliberate. Of course, there's lots of other people involved in it. There's cowardice in verse 2. There's evil in verse 3. There's a conspiracy in verse 4. There's greed. All those things are involved. It's not a good thing. It's a horribly evil thing that they kill Jesus. But he's the one really who's in control of the whole situation. He's the one who lays down his life. But why does he do that? Well, it's deliberate. His death is planned. It's deliberate. Why? To establish his kingdom. Did you see that? It's a royal death. That's point number two. He says that a couple of times that he's not going to eat this Passover again until the kingdom of heaven comes. He's not going to drink from the fruit of the vine. He's not going to take wine again until the kingdom of God comes. 
that he's going to suffer. You see, Jesus knows he has to die in order to begin his kingdom, which is a really strange thing, isn't it? Because usually when our kings or prime ministers or queens die, it's the end of their reign. Their kingdom finishes and a new one begins. But with Jesus, it's the other way around somehow. His death starts it all off. That's a really strange thing. So what is going on there? Well, I think the key to understanding all of that is in the kind of meal that they're eating. Did you see it? It's the Passover meal. You might know a bit about that history, you might not. So let me run you through it a little bit. The Passover was a really special meal for the Jewish people. It's a meal that looks back to their history and looks forward to the future they're looking forward to. It's, um, it's all about the story of them being released from Egypt, that they were under this, under, in slavery, under uh, the rule of this evil King Pharaoh, but God rescued them through a man called Moses. God rescued them. And the way that it happened on the very last night of their captivity, God passed through the land in judgment and killed every firstborn son of any family that was in Egypt. Why would he do that? It sounds pretty horrible. Well, it's a judgment for what they had tried to do to the people of Israel, tried to kill all of their sons right back at the beginning of Exodus. So God comes to judge them, to bring on their own heads what they what they started. But he says, every firstborn is going to die unless there's a death in that family already. Unless, and they do this special thing where they take a lamb into the family for four days. It has to be a perfect lamb, spotless, without any kind of broken bones or weird bits. It's got to be a good and whole, healthy lamb. Into the family becomes part of the family for four days. And then they kill it. And they take the blood of that lamb and they put it on the doorpost. And then that night they eat that special meal. They eat the lamb, they eat the bread, they drink the wine. They get ready to leave. And on that night, God's um, angel of judgment comes through the land. And every firstborn dies apart from in the houses where there's already been a death. A death of something that's been in that family. That lamb. There's blood on the doorpost. The death has happened already. And so judgment passes over. And they get to step outside under that blood into freedom. That's what this meal commemorated. The day when, if you like, the origin story of the people of Israel, the day when they began to be a nation, where they were free from slavery and they left Egypt and moved towards home. So it was a meal that looked back and they had lamb, they had bread, they had four different cups that would go around and they would, the kids, the youngest kids would ask questions of the older ones and they would recount the story and, and talk about how they were freed from Egypt and became a people that God was their God and they were his people and they, they went home. So it was a meal that looked back, but it was also a meal that looked forward, that looked forward to when God's king would come and fix the whole world, not just give them a little bit of land and free them from, from Egypt, but free the whole of the world from slavery to sin and death and darkness. See, it was a meal that looked back and that looked forward. And Jesus is there saying, Take this bread, take this cup, because I am the lamb. Did <laughs> you see that? The lamb kind of disappears in the story. You hear about it right at the beginning in verse 7. This was the time, the day, when they had to sacrifice the Passover lamb, but all of a sudden you don't hear about the lamb again. They don't even eat lamb, because I think what's going on is that Jesus is saying, I am the lamb. I am the one who has died for you who's died and through this death, I'm going to bring you, I'm going to make you a people and I'm going to be your king. Through this death, I'm going to, like Sammy was talking about last week, talking about victory, I am going to defeat death, that greatest em enemy. I'm going to wipe out evil because if you like, I'm going to drink it up in my own death. It's going to be, it's going to be used up in killing me. Evil is going to be finished. And sin, well, it's, it's all going to be washed away because my death is for sin. Jesus is saying, when he says he's the Passover lamb, as he's eating this meal, he's saying, I'm going to start a new kingdom where people are free, where people get to step out through this doorway underneath my blood and out and into freedom. So you see, Jesus' death is deliberate. He plans it. He knows it's going to happen. It's been predicted from ancient times. That lamb was a hint of it. It's a royal death that starts and establishes his kingdom because it's really the death that brings victory. It's so maybe a strange thing to get your head around, but it's a death that's for you. Do you see that? It's a sacrificial death for you. That's number three. Let's look particularly in detail at the cups and the bread. 
Jesus says, after taking the cup in verse 17, Take this, divide it among you, for I tell you, I won't drink again until the, uh, from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He's looking forward to a day when the kingdom's established. And then he took bread, verse 19, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do you see Jesus two times saying, This is for you? He takes those simple things on the table that would have meant something for generations of Israelites, and he, he remakes them and pours new meaning into them. He says, This is this bread, this bread now, it's going to remind you of my body torn apart for you. This cup that you drink, that's poured out, that's passed around and shared, it's going to remind you of my blood poured out. But what does that do? Well, we've talked about it a little bit already. Jesus' broken body is broken for us. We should be broken. We should be judged by God. We should be left behind in Egypt, but he comes and he's broken instead of us. It was his body that was broken on the tree. It was his body that took our sin and died. It was his body that took the darkness and died. It was his body that suffered all that we should suffer and so cleans us of all of our guilty failures. So his body is broken for us. And did you see what Jesus does with his body? Pictured in the bread, it's not some magical thing where his kind of bread is actually his body. No, he's, he's there in his body and he's giving them the bread. So it's a picture of his body, it's a metaphor. He gives it to them and they pass it around and give it to each other. His body, he says, this is my body given for you. Not bought by us, by doing lots of good things so that eventually God is kind of persuaded to forgive us. Not, um, not purchased by us, but given to us by him as a gift. Did you see that? So it's something to be received. Something, oh man, what Jesus gives to us is something so much better than we, we could ever give to him. What he gives to us is so much more reliable than, we could, than anything we could ever give to him. Because I'm not reliable, am I? I, I? Your good stuff, the things that we try and do to offer to God, to kind of persuade him to, to be good to us, they're never reliable. We can't be reliably good, but Jesus can be. Jesus' gift is reliable for us. What Jesus gives to us is far more, far better than we could, anything we could ever offer to him. His body is given to us to clean us, to give us a fresh start, a new day, and make us a new people. That's in his blood as well, this blood of the new covenant. That looks back not so much to Exodus 12, where you read the story of the Passover, but Exodus 24, if you want to look it up later, is another time after the people are out of Egypt, they gather at the mountain and Moses gives them God's law and sprays them with blood. It's a bit of a horrible picture, but it's the blood of a bull that cleanses them from sin and that seals, if you like, seals in blood this covenant. Exodus 24, I think it's verse 12, 13, you can go and read it. Um, no, it's verse 8 and 9. Exodus 24, 8 and 9, the story of this, this covenant that God makes through Moses with the people, and they become his people, and he's their God. But they keep failing, they keep messing it up, and they keep having to go and sacrifice more bulls and more goats and more lambs and more things because they keep sinning and it keeps happening over and over again. And, and it's good, but it's, it's, not, it's not quite fully there until Jesus comes and says, in his suffering, he's gonna fulfill. He's gonna fulfill this meal. He's gonna fulfill that promise, and he's gonna make a new covenant. Can I read you about the, to you about the new covenant from Jeremiah 31? He's another prophet in the Old Testament who looks forward, and, and God says through Jeremiah, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. And with the people of Judah, it will be not like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. This is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time. This new covenant, I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they'll be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbour or say to one another, know the Lord, because they'll all know me from the least to the greatest declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Do you see this new covenant? 
once and for all, God is going to do something where, where he'll be able to forget about our sins, to treat us like we're completely clean, where we won't have to go back to the temple again and again, to his presence, which is kind of distant and far over there, through a priest, through all these animals dying. No, Jesus comes and he fulfills all of that and says, come to me and I'll give you rest. I'll be with you to the very end of the age. My death will count for you. I'll be the sacrificial Passover lamb so that you can come into my presence, so that my presence can come into you and that you'll be clean. All of that guilty failure will be gone. You'll be mine and I'll be yours. That's what Jesus is doing at the cross. He's dying to take away all of our sins in his broken body and he's writing a new agreement, a new covenant in his own blood where he takes all of the failures that we should take. He takes all of the consequences of our mess, of our breaking the covenant. He says, I'll deal with that. I'll cover both sides of the agreement. They'll meet in Jesus. And so you'll be mine forever. How good is that? And how good then is this meal that we get to share together where Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. And we say, yeah, we want to do that. But how do we do that? Well, okay, the first way you could do that is, well, is by coming to the table. I mean, by faith, coming to Jesus and having him serve himself to you. Because what is, what is eating? When, well, eating is that, like it's when you take food and you swallow it down into the very center of your being and it nourishes your whole soul. And so when Jesus says, take my body, what I've done for you, take my blood, all that I've shed for you and eat that in faith, it's not some weird magical thing. What he's saying is take that into the center of your being and make that the thing that nourishes, that gives you life. Have faith in me, eat me and all that I've done to you. That needs to be the thing that is your food day by day. So it's have you done that with Jesus? Is he your Passover lamb? The one who's taken away your sin? Is he your Passover lamb that you've eaten that gives you spiritual life day by day? Well, that's the first question, the most important thing. Is he yours? Because he gives himself to you and says, come and eat. So have you come to the table and eaten him? That's question number one. Well, question number two, who are you going to pass that on to? If that's you, then Jesus, like in this meal, um, where he passes them the bread and the wine and says, give it to each other. He calls us to do that as well. To say, this isn't just a personal thing between me and you. No, this is something for the whole of the earth. Where everybody from every tribe and tongue and nation can come and know the lamb who is slain. Where there'll be people around the throne, Revelation 7, singing, worthy is the lamb who is slain. To receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength, honour and glory and praise. This is something for everybody to know about. So who have you passed that bread to? Who have you passed that wine to and said, do you know Jesus? Do you know the Passover lamb who cleanses us of all of our guilty failures? The one who gives us new life, makes us his people and brings us out of slavery to the old way of life and, and makes us new again. Do you know him? Have you shared that news with anyone this week? With Christians to encourage them, passing on that bread. With others to say, you know, there's, an, there's another way of life to live, which isn't based on what we do on trying to keep my end of the bargain so that God will be nice to me when I die. No, do you know that there's a new promise, a new way of life, sealed in Jesus' blood, where he does everything, where he gives himself to you and says, come and be in my child, be my bride, be my person. I wonder if you've passed that good news to anybody on this week and, and invited them to come to the table of the king. Well, there's a third way we can apply this and that's whenever we eat. One, we should eat that regular meal together where we take communion, where we're taking bread and wine together with God's people and remembering him. We should do that often. So if you haven't been able to be in church for a while, if there's anything keeping you from coming, if there's anything we could do to, to sweep that road, roadblock away, well, please let me know what it is so that you can come together again with God's people and eat that meal and remember Jesus together. But we can do that every meal as well. Not that every meal is communion, but every meal we eat something that's been broken. If you're a meat eater, you eat an animal that's died and it's, in a way, it's given its life for you so that you can have nourishment and live. And that's a picture of Jesus, isn't it? Even if you're a vegetable, you could say, we take this steamed broccoli or whatever it is you like to eat. And that vegetable in some way has died and given its life so that you could have life. And that's a picture of Jesus at every meal. Let's bow our knees, let's bow our heads and remember, Jesus, whose life was given so that we can have life. 
Isn't that cool? We can do it at every meal. So I'd encourage you to do that with other Christians over coffee, with your families over breakfast and muesli at dinner, whatever you're eating. Remember Jesus who gave his life for you. Isn't that good news? The Passover lamb who's made a new promise with us, who's poured out his life for the life of the world. For you and for me, this royal death planned from before the foundation of the world so that you and I could come home and eat at the table of the King. Amen.
you, our God, are incomprehensible, yet you hear our prayers. You are known even though you are beyond our knowledge. All our desires come to rest in you. We never seek or search in vain. To you we come in all our difficulties and distress, so fill us with yourself. Give us a spirit of seeking, a lifestyle of pursuing, so that when life concerns us, our thoughts and desires rise to you. You are the one who soothes our sorrows, sanctifies our successes, and readies us to love our brothers and sisters. It is an awesome thought to consider that you have made us to know you, the author of all things. It is an awesome thought to consider that you have made us to resemble you, the perfect and excellent one. It is an awesome thought to consider that you have made us to enjoy you, the source of all our happiness. O oh God, be all to us now on our journey, that you were when we began. Whether we wake or sleep, let your presence go with us. In sorrow you are our help, in fear you are our deliverer, in despair you lift us up. You keep your promises to your people, praise your wonderful name. Amen. Well, our service is nearly over. It's my weekly opportunity, privilege, to thank you guys for tuning in, for sticking around. Thanks, John, for his contribution this morning on all those people who have made it so that you can hear from, encounter, and enjoy the living God together this morning online. We mentioned at the start some of the things that were going on in the life of the church. Um, I hope that they're somewhere there in the back of your memory. I'm sure they will come up again, the information uh, towards the end. Let me just remind you that this evening we've got Palm Sunday event in Llicern. Um, that on Monday, Thursday, we're going to be gathering up in Targwaith. We have Good Friday service, we've got Easter egg hunt, we've got prayer meeting, Easter Sunday, gathering together and baptisms down the beach. Um, it's a full, and I pray, fun and fruitful time for us that lies ahead. Oh, how, what a wonderful privilege it's been to think about how Christ is the one who gives, how we are the ones who come to his table and receive how we are beneficiaries of a far greater gift than we could ever hope to, to purchase or earn ourselves. Thank you, John, for that reminder. I pray that that would be um, in our minds, in our hearts, in our ears as we go forth this morning. Let me finish with a couple of verses from Psalm 18. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.